good evening and welcome you all for today's lecture i am kamala gunawardena again a council member and the chair person for the knowledge sharing sub committee of civil engineering sectional committee i think there are new participants today in this forum and i will brief what are our schedules from civil engineering sectional committee and our future very recent future plans basically we are organizing this uh, uh, presentations from civil engineering sectional committee on tuesdays and thursdays are technical presentations uh, actually today it's a tuesday we have we are exclusively reserved tuesdays for series of lectures from and of uh, meteorized buildings designs and constructions by professor tishan jaisinga we started this program on end of uh, 2021 last year december and we have already done with four programs webinars together with a uh, overview of the history of civil engineering in sri lanka that's the introduction lectures professor conducted under this uh, medium rise building designs and construction series our number one presentation was an overview of medium rise buildings designs and construction number two was structural design methodology number three the design philosophy for a medium rise buildings about 10 floors number four was design philosophy for medium rise buildings of 15 to 20 story range so wednesdays we have planned to arrange non technical presentations and we have done with three presentations so far our main focus for wednesday programs are to organize member development programs and some public awareness programs we are our civil of civil engineers can assist support even the public uh, out of this you all can share things that to develop your instincts your insights and also to develop your pro- professionalism while achieving a better living standard this is what we need to focus on on wednesdays actually we are receiving very good responses from our resource persons whom we have invited for our programs uh, and they were, they are actually eagerly waiting to share their experiences with all our participants so that's a great thing civil engineer sectional committee will do our best and deliver stuff for your benefit with the leadership of uh, professor jay singh our on wednesday some pres- first presentation was samajya tirasara sangwardhana engineer wage karya it called engineers role in execution of community sustainability by engineer dr lakshit pradeep and second one was was a good one again magic of thinking big from dr engineer dr La- ranil sukadadas and third one was entry of engineers to the large world of decision making it was done by engineer shanta kamaladas so thursdays we have designed for multidisciplinary technical presentations and number of professionals are now actually uh, even now we have identified we have done with three programs up to now uh, that uh, thursdays number one was uh, blast can structures resist that was done by engineer dr lakshita fernando number 2 was bridges and flyovers again professor jay singh under the title and introduction on sri lankan scenario and number 3 awareness of civil engineers on professional review process and how to face confidently by our past president engineer kp ayu dharmapal as a brief in what we have done so far and i will remind you about our next week's plans let me come back 
to our presentations again. You can join the webinar tomorrow by Engineer Brigadier KDA Pereira on the topic suitability of standard bidding documents, which is a well chosen title subject for our civil engineers. I hope you will get that advantage. Uh, Thursday, the after tomorrow, we are starting the, this is a very interesting, uh, interesting topic people have been re requesting us. We are starting the first lecture about the design and construction technologies used in Central Expressway Section 2. Actually, this is the first Expressway project that fully accomplished with local resources, including financing, designing, design reviewing, construction, construction monitoring, supervision, project management, so on. All these things are done by a local team of professionals. This will be continuously, we will share the knowledge, our knowledge about the various aspects of highway constructions in the industry, especially including expressways. We will mainly focus on expressways under this series. Professor, Yass, sorry, Engineer Asela will be conducting the after tomorrow. I thank Engineer Manjul Samarasinghe, Subcommittee Chairman, for taking a lot of interest to make this program a success under the guidance and the, or the support of Professor Deshan Jai Singh, Chairman of CSC. Actually, this has become a reality definitely because of the other assistance of respective subcommittee leaders. We have to thank them. Uh, that will be done end of the project. Professor Jai Singer's time, actually, I took a few minutes now to brief this because I thought this will be useful for you all because those who couldn't join with the physically up to now, you all can refer the YouTube and you can update your missed previous presentations. Yes, everyone, now... We are, before we start the thing, actually, I'll, I'll mention about the today's thing also. We are starting the today's event after some announcements, and it is. Uh, 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 Engineer Kamala, I'm, I'm now on. I'm okay, now thank on. you, Professor. Yes. Thank you. Uh, it is an honor for me to make this instigating note, even though you are now sure the speaker today is <laughs> a veteran in this specific field. And he has taken the challenge of giving you the best knowledge, best know-how about the design and construction of medium rise buildings under many key areas. He is again, Professor Tishan Jai Singer, Senior Professor of Civil Engineering at the University of Maratua. His today's topic is transfer structures for medium rise buildings and is a continuation of this lecture, lecture series. Without further ado, I call Professor Jai Singer to take over. Before that, Professor, can I uh, ask Engineer Manjula whether he has any announcement to do? Yeah, yeah, please do so. Please do so. Yeah, thank you, everyone. Enjoy this evening with this important webinar. Thank you so much. Engineer Manjula, do you have anything to? Yes, yeah, thank you. Thank you, Madam and Professor Jai Singer. And, uh, uh, there were many requests uh, to share the already completed uh, presentations to our members. So uh, <clears throat> to honor the request, uh, we, our using section committee, create a new YouTube channel so that you can uh, uh, oh. look and uh, watch all the previous presentations. Still, we are up uploading the presentations. We were already uploaded. And I have already shared the uh, video link with this uh, message. And uh, please log into and uh, put a like, and then you can receive oh, an update. Uh, that's the only message. Uh, and uh, over to you, Professor Jaising. Uh, to yeah, the, the, um, uh, Engineer Manjula, you know, there's a small technical problem. The laptop is still slow. Just give I me know. one or two minutes until I get it, uh, you know, get it going again. Because uh, I had to, I leave the leave from the laptop and rejoin. Right? I, I'm I'm on phone, but uh, you know, I'm using phone and laptop both. Laptop to for video and uh, phone for uh, talking. Right, sir. Just give me a little time. Uh, and in the meantime, uh, there are many members. I think uh, here also uh, uh, can provide the uh, resource person 
they, they have expertise to the civil inspection committee to enhance the our quality and uh, enhance the quality and sta quality standards. So um, we request our members to join with the uh, committee and give your active part, active support. To yeah. uh, there are many, there are many subcommittees in our sectional committee. So I have shared the details uh, in our WhatsApp group. Come on. I will again uh, put the WhatsApp uh, group link also. Then you can join with our, WhatsApp, uh, our, our team and uh, give your fullest support. Can you see it? Mm. All right. Okay. Now it's possible. Huh? Right. Today we'll talk about transfer structures. So first we have to see why we need transfer structures. Uh, Angelo, can you hear me properly? Yes, we can. Yeah, okay. Yes, very well. Yeah, okay. So basically uh, we have a regulation. Uh, in Sri Lanka, where we t we, it says to stop uh, when we have buildings, say we have a housing scheme in a, in a say apartment scheme, then we need every house exceeding 50 square meters will need 4.8 meter by 2.4 meter area for car parking. So each house will need a car park. So if you have 200 houses, we need 200 car parking spaces. Which means, you know, to accommodate 200 cars, uh, say we are having a 40 story, uh, 50 story building, 50 story building, each floor, we have four apartments. It's very common to have four apartments per floor. It's very common to have four apartments per floor. Because you can have some arrangement like this, Madhushan, focus group, where you get uh, the core, something like that. So this is a core area. And these are apartment one, apartment two, apartment three, apartment four. So we have four apartments. We have four apartments. Oh, where are you going? Okay, I'll start in now. Sorry about the technical problem. So basically, I'll start right from beginning. Now, uh, you can see in uh, Sri Lankan building regulations adopted by Uni uh, Urban Development Authority, for every apartment, we need one car park. And the size, minimum size of the car park is 4.8 meters by 2.4 meters. But uh, for larger vehicles, you need a uh, few uh, bigger car parking, uh, bigger vehicle parking spaces as well. So let's see. We are having uh, 200 apartments in a building, and we are having four apartments per floor. So this is the arrangement. So uh, this is one possible arrangement. So this area is the core, where you get uh, lifts, uh, the staircases, the and any other uh, areas that you need, like you know, for services, service shops, anything. Everything will be in that area. And then you'll get uh, four apartments because this will give all round view for each apartment. So that will be a very attractive way of, uh, you know, getting four apartments per floor. But, you know, in some instances, you get eight apartments per floor as well. So what they do is if, they are, if you're getting eight, then these will be a small apartments and the corner ones will be bigger apartments. So you can get a one bedroom or two bedroom small apartments filling the gaps, whereas the bigger apartments can be on the corners. So if you have 200 apartments, you need 50 floors. So we have a building with 50 floors and we, have, we need about five floors of car parking. So all these areas will be car parking. Now you can see a real problem. What is the problem? We need a lot of space here below the 
below the transfer structure and we need some different space above the transfer structure which means we need to have something to transfer something to transfer the loads so basically the problem is we can't have the same grid above and below above the car park we have one grid below the car park we have a different grid and above the car park so let's take an example we might have one one grid and the size of the grid can be something like so this way we need about 5 meters this way we might need about, about clear clear space of 7.2 meters 8 meters or more this way so the center center line will be 8 7.8 meters or more so you get 7.8 meters here and this say 5 meters but uh, when you are doing the apartment uh, we need uh, partition so you might get rooms and you might go for a structure like this that means we get small walls so we might connect these walls by using beams by using beams you are connecting these so we are creating a grid of beams so once you have a grid of beams we can support any partition wall we can support any partition wall so this is one common arrangement that has been used but later day we i can show you how to optimize further but today we'll assume that you know we are having a arrangement where 50 floors will be uh, supported by walls walls can be about 1.8 meters of length 1.2 to 1.8 meters of length the thickness of the walls can be about 150 millimeters and that will allow us to create a set of beams and once you have a set of beams we can limit the uh, limit the slab spans to about 4 to 4.5 meters and you know a slab uh, generally we use a minimum slab thickness of 125 but sometimes we go for 150 millimeter slabs because we need good sound insulation because we need good sound insulation in a part if you have 125 the sound insulation level be, level can be slightly lower so so you are going to have slabs of 125 to 150 millimeter thickness and that will allow you to easily span something something up to about five meters but if you are having partition walls you might prefer some secondary beams or some arrangement but let's assume that we are going to get some walls at some spacing but these walls are not going to coincide with the columns below so we are having walls we are having walls and we are having lo lower columns at different locations so what happens we need a slab we need a slab so we need a slab then you have to ask, what is the thickness of the slab? 1.5 to 1.8 meters. That is the thickness of the slab. Now you have to ask few questions. First question. Can we construct a slab of 1.8 meters? Five, floor, five or six floors above the foundation level. What are the problems you are going to get? You are going to get a huge weight. If the slab thickness is 1.8, 1.8 into 24, something like 40 kilonewtons per meter squared. 40 kilonewtons per meter squared load will be coming. It can be even more. But I, I just got a value, something like 40, you can see. 24 into 1.8 is, is a more than can be more than 40 but let's say 40 kilonewtons per meter squared what is the impulse load that you use for your slabs maximum of 2 kilonewtons 
for me to start so on the law for uh, partitions are 1 kN per meter squared still but how much load we are going to 40 kN per meter squared so what will happen all these steps will fail so we need extra support for all these steps so see even if you design a transfer plate it's very difficult to construct it so how do you construct it what you do is we will cast about 450 mm thick slab or 500 mm thick slab that can take a load of something like rather 30 kN per meter square so this means this slab will need lot of reinforcement you have to design that slab as a flat slab which means a thick slab of 500 mm supported by large columns of 1.5 m by 1.5 m at a spacing of something like 7.8 m at a spacing of 8 m then what you do is you will design the slab for all the extra loads and then you have to provide additional reinforcement why the first space first stage you design the slab to carry the load of the rest of the slab and the rest of the building is not there so that is enough after that now already the reinforcement is stretched now you have to consider all the loads from above which means you need another set of reinforcement but now the slab thickness is 1.8 meters what you have to do is you have to provide the addition of reinforcement you have to provide the addition of reinforcement and you will see huge amount of reinforcement is needed but now today you know the problem what is the cost of one ton of reinforcement 260000 as the market price but by once you finish you might charge 270000 per ton what will happen huge cost huge cost so what is the ideal solution now you can actually use have a structure without transfer plate then that particular building can be fairly efficient but the problem is because you have to provide so many car parking spaces you can't have a sub optimal car park and an optimum building on the other hand you cannot have a sub optimal building and optimum car park neither might work so because of that reason we generally go for transfer plates although it's very 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 expensive so you have always keep in mind transfer plates are very expensive if you have land you can go for another car park do something that might be cheaper than trying to optimize the structure in the car park and optimize the structure in the superstructure the tower when you try to optimize both you will need a car transfer plate but on the other hand if you have a lot of land that you can have car park then maybe it's worth considering the fact whether it's possible to have a separate car park and separate car park need not be a completely separate one it can be part of the building so you have the tower you have the car park and this is not optimum and you have another car park area extend the building this is not optimum because you are avoiding the transfer plate and then you optimize this and have a proper car park because you can have any column spacing in the extended car park so that way you might be able to solve the problem but most of the time you know you can't control the project like that because either the land is not enough or the architect is not willing to have a separate car park then you will find architect wants both optimized the architect like to have optimum superstructure the tower and optimum car park and when you try to optimize both you will find 
Now you need a transplant. But transplant, what is the behavior? What is the behavior of a plate? And what are the problems we encounter with plates? You have to understand it. Before we design and uh, do whatever we want, first we have to understand. Now, now what is the problem with the plate? How the plate behaves? Plate. Now, in uh, when you are doing highway engineering, when you have a plate like this, we divide the plate into a grid of beams. We don't uh, we don't analyze it as a plate. We analyze it as a grillage, a grid of beams. We say we have beams in both directions. And that's a good way of looking at a plate. So if you have a plate, then what do you get? You get shear in each beam. You can get torsion. And you can get flexion. You can get flexion. So if you have 1.8 meter thick slab, what can you say about it? This is in tension. Little bit of concrete is in compression. What is the rest? Rest is cracked concrete. Rest is cracked concrete. Concrete that is cracked up to the neutral axis. Is it efficient or not? It is not efficient. It is not efficient. But because we are having only one structure, one pounds of blade, sometimes we don't worry whether it's efficient or not, we just have it. But you have to always keep in mind, thick slabs are not efficient. Why? They have huge amount of concrete, and this huge amount of concrete can add huge amount of weight, and all this weight will create a lot of bending moments, a lot of shear due to the self-weight. So, but still, you'll find many engineers design these transfer plates knowing very well they are not efficient. They are not efficient. The problem with a thick slab is any concrete below the neutral axis is cracked. And it's not doing any service except providing cover to the reinforcement or preventing corrosion. So, you have to always keep in mind that. We are having a very inefficient structure. Then how do you design it? Now, if you want to plan model, this plate, not as a grillage, you can model it using plate elements in NITAS or SAP or MIDAS. You can use MIDAS, SAP, 2000 or ETAPS. In all these programs, they have Shell elements, and you can use shell elements, and shell elements will give you a proper connectivity. And the shell elements have five degrees of freedom at each node. And uh, so, once you connect it, you can get bending moments, shear forces, and uh, bending moments, shear forces, and torsional moments. So, first question What do you think about torsional moments? They are not a problem at all. Why? When you have a thick plate like this, the shear flow occurs around it. Shear flows like this, torsion and shear flows like this. And here you can see it's 1.8 meters of thickness. So you get a force F here, force F here. What can you say about the lever arm? Maybe about 1.5 meters. If the lever arm is 1.5 meters, what can you say about the torsional moment carrying capacity of a slab? Very high. You don't need to worry about torsional moment carrying capacity because the moment you provide flexural reinforcement, cut control in reinforcement, the torsional shear will not be a major problem, but you can always check it. Check it and see whether torsional shear is too much or not, but generally it's not a problem. Then what is the problem? The problem is flexion. Because we are putting concentrated loads, the loads of 50 flows coming at as concentrated loads on to the slab. Concentrated loads onto the slab. So what will happen to the slab then? 
you will get bending moments and because you have 1.8 meter thickness or 1.5 meter thickness you can always design the design the slab to carry whatever the bending moment you get because it's a huge thickness 1.5 to 1.8 meters and i have seen some projects they have even gone up to 3 meters thick transfer plate and in one building in colombo i have checked it I have, I have made a model of it. This was somewhere in 2006 or 2007, 15 years ago. And it was a design done in Singapore. They had three meter thickness for the transfer plate at certain locations. And certain other locations, 1.8 meters. So basically you can see, casting three meter thick concrete is not, a, not an easy task. And it's huge amount of concrete and huge amount of weight. So these are things we have to always think how to optimize, how to optimize. So basically you can see flexure means we need reinforcement. And then how about the top reinforcement? Say we have a big bending moment, we have tension reinforcement here. Now here you get compression, but we need Track control in reinforcement here. That track control in reinforcement is needed at the top. So you need a lot of track control in reinforcement. And all the codes carry some guideline on track controlling reinforcement in thick slabs. On thick slabs, they give track control in reinforcement. And for example, in, uh, in the bridge codes, they say, consider only the outer 500 millimeters and provide Provide crack control in reinforcement considering a thickness of 500 millimeters. So, depending on the code of practice you are using, you have to refer the special clauses they have given to find the reinforcement for crack controlling. The reason is if you consider the full thickness and provide the crack control in reinforcement of, say, if you are using British codes, 0 0.00, so that's 0.13%, 0.13%. Because the thickness is high, you still get huge amount of reinforcement. You get, still get huge amount of reinforcement. So because of that reason, you have to always think carefully. So that's one penalty. So you, you have to control the crack. Because otherwise, this is crack. After construction, thermal cracks, early thermal cracks, all kinds of cracks can occur. So you have to control the cracks. But because tension reinforcement is there, bottom, there's no problem because there will be plenty of reinforcement in the bottom. Then what will happen? At each column, what will happen to the slab? Now slab is going to bend in the wrong way. Slab is going to bend in the other direction. That means now you need top reinforcement above the column. Top reinforcement above the column. So you need a lot of that. And then, what will happen? Then the biggest problem in the slab is shear. The slabs are not very good in carrying shear. So what do you do? We provide reinforcement in the slab. To carry shear, these are vertical reinforcement. So you might get vertical reinforcement in the slab, something like 20 millimeter bars at 400 center to center everywhere in the slab. You are going to end up with huge amount of vertical reinforcement to carry the shear because you don't like the such a big load transferred without shear reinforcement so what you do is you will provide 20 millimeter bars at 300 to 400 millimeter centers now you can see there will be huge amount of vertical reinforcement one advantage is this vertical reinforcement can be used easily to support the top slab, top, top, top mat of reinforcement. So there's an advantage. So basically, these top reinforcement will be supported by these U bars that you provide to carry shear. So that is a good, good news. What is the bad news? You can't walk inside the slab because you have 1.8 meter slab. If you want to go and do something, you can't walk inside easily because there's reinforcement everywhere. You can't walk inside. So there are difficulties. Because of all these reasons, 
we are we generally prefer two other options so don't go for a transfer play just because you need two bits always consider two other options before you consider transfer plate as the option you have to consider two more options you have to consider two more options what are they beams transfer beams or cellular transfer plates Now, what is a transfer beam? You get a huge beam like this. Now, if you have a transfer beam, what is a better shape? The rectangular shape, uh, a rectangular or a square? What is a better shape, A and B? Which is better? If you are using transfer beams, what is the better shape? Always we think uh, the rectangular shape is the good shape for the beam. Is that right? Engineer Manjul, what do you think? Uh, anybody again can give an answer? A or B? Can you hear me? Yeah, we can. Yeah, A or B? I mean, B, I, I'm asking a simple question. Square shape or a rectangular shape? For a transfer beam, what is the better shape? The better shape is square. And you'll ask, why? Because always we learn the beams should be can be rectangular. But transfer beams, we prefer square shape. Why? The reason is transfer beams, there's no guarantee that we we'll have the load on the beam in the center. Sometimes you might find the load on the beam, the wall is not at the center, but on a side, but on a side. So what will happen if we apply a huge load here? What will happen to this beam? That is going to twist. The beam is going to twist. The beam is going to twist. Then if the beam is going to twist, we are going to get a torsional moment acting on the beam. And most of you would have, wouldn't have designed a beam for a torsional moment. But beams can be designed for torsional moment, but beams are not very efficient in carrying torsional moment. So how do you make a beam efficient in carrying torsional moment? The torsional stress depends on the minimum dimension, not on the maximum dimension. When you look at the second moment of area, 112 BD cubed, which dimension determines the second moment of area? The bigger dimension is the governing one, 112 BD cubed. So the bigger dimension is the depth, depth is governing. But when it comes to torsional stresses, Torsional stresses are determined by the minimum dimension. So if you have a huge beam, deep beam, very, very narrow, very narrow. The torsional moment carrying capacity of that beam is very low. The torsional moment carrying capacity of that beam is very low. So how do you improve it? Make it square. So then you can say the minimum dimension and the maximum dimension are more or less the same. Then you will find the, the stresses, torsional stresses can be minimized. Torsional stresses can be minimized, right? So you both Euro code and uh, British code both use methods for designing for torsion. They are not very different, but uh, you can easily master the how to design a beam for torsion by looking at the example given in Moosley and Bungie. The book by Moosley and Bungie, edition six and edition seven, they give a method for designing for torsion. So if you want to design a beam for torsion, go through that example, that is a proper example, 
And if you follow that example, you can easily provide torsional reinforcement. But you have to keep in mind, torsional reinforcement is not going to be as easy as shear reinforcement. Torsional reinforcement can be T20 bars at 150 or 200 centers. If the, if the beam is subjected to significant amount of shear, the torsional reinforcement that you get, the torsional reinforcement is the outer reinforcement because torsion goes, the outermost reinforcement will be the torsional reinforcement. Outer, outermost closed loop will be the torsional reinforcement. And that reinforcement can be in the range of T20 bars at 150 or 200. Huge amount of reinforcement. So always you have to keep in mind, if you are having a transfer beam, there is a possibility that we may not load the beam at the center. If you do not load the beam at the center, we'll get a bending moment. So because we are getting a bending moment, what will happen? So we we'll get a torsional moment. Because we are getting a torsional moment, we have to provide torsional reinforcement. And these right, torsional reinforcement will be in addition to all the reinforcement needed for flexion. Then what is the advantage of a transfer beam? Well, we are not getting beams everywhere. We might get a beam every four meters apart, four meters apart, or we might get a beam five meters apart. And generally when you get transfer beams, we try to arrange the transfer beams in a grid. So arrange the be transfer beams in a grid. What is, that? What is the reason? When you arrange the transfer beams in a grid and have a 200 millimeter slab at the top, the torsional effects can be on the beam can be reduced to a great extent. But generally when you are modeling, you, you, you don't model the slab, you will, you will model only the beams. You will model only the, only the beams. You will model only the beams and then we, I have to ask a question. When you are modeling the beams, how do we model it? We, we model it as a dimensionless element, dimensionless element. Whatever the size of the beam, we model it at the center line. We model the beam at the center line. This is the center line, so we put the beam there. We put the beam there. And we might find the wall is here, beam is here. And this is 0.6 meters. So the center line of the beam is here, and we are having 1.5 meter wide beam. Uh, so 1.5, that is enough, yes. And I, let's say we have a wall six, 600 millimeters away from the center line of the beam. Then how do you model this, model the support? What you do is, we break the beam here, we break the beam here, we can have a rigid arm. Rigid arm. Rigid arm means, you know, you will have a section which is the same size as the, as, as the transfer beam. And then you support the wall on the rigid arm. So what will happen? Once you create the model, ask it to analyze, now the how the model knows the loads are not acting at the center, they are acting with an eccentricity. Because the model knows the loads are at an eccentricity, now the torsional effect will automatically be transferred onto the transfer beam. So you, you, when you are modeling, you have to model the walls in the walls above the translate at the correct level, the beams at the correct center line. And then if, the, if, if there's no connectivity, because they are not aligned, you can make them aligned by using rigid arms where you are going to tell the program, I'm having some eccentric loading. And the eccentric loading is represented by rigid arm. Rigid arm is a beam having a fairly high second moment of failure. Fairly high second amount of area. Sometimes what we do is we put a small beam and multiply using set modifiers in programs. We multiply the I value. On the other hand, you can allocate a big section. When you allocate the big section, make sure that particular small section 
has no weight. So you have to define a concrete without weight because these these rigid arms are not in the real structure. What will happen if you if you model with a rigid arm having a weight? You are adding extra elements onto your model, extra weight onto your model. So all that's key. You have to define a weightless concrete, weightless concrete, and this weightless concrete has to be used to 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 represent all the additional members which are not really there, but your model has got them. Now this is what we call creating a mathematical model of the structure. We don't create the structure; we create a mathematical model of the structure. The material model can be very different to a structure, or it can be similar to the structure. And last time I showed you how to convert a three-dimensional structure, which is does not twist, to a two-dimensional structure. So this two-dimensional structure that I showed you last time is a mathematical model. It's not the real structure. But here, what you do is. Again, you are creating a mathematical model, not the real structure. Because in the real structure, you have a big beam, but on the model we can not represent a big beam. So what we do is we we'll use a rigid arm and support the wall at the correct location. So in doing so, we can easily induce the positional moment on the beam, and that will that will be the real situation that you are trying to model. So it's very important that you look into this matter. Is that clear? Any questions uh, on the chat box? Uh, there is one question. Yeah. What is that? This question was kept a bit early. Uh, do yeah. we need uh, distribution bars to connect vertical shear reinforcement? Oh yes, yes, yes. When you have these uh, uh, these bars. You have to ensure that the vertical reinforcement goes above the bars, because otherwise there is no anchorage for the shear. Shear, shear is very important that we allow the development of tension in the shear reinforcement. So, develop tension in the shear reinforcement. You have to send it around another horizontal bar. So, you have to make sure the U bar that you use to carry shear. Starts below the bottom reinforcement and goes above the top reinforcement. It's very important. Otherwise, there is no, that that particular bar cannot carry shear. Because the moment you get tension, there is no anchorage for the bar. Always make sure this uh, U-shaped shear reinforcement goes below the bottom reinforcement and above the top reinforcement. It has to be. So that's why you know you get a lot of uh, difficulties when you have huge transfer plates, and I all I'm always for avoiding the thick transfer plates because of these construction difficulties. And if you want, you can ask a top engineer like uh, Samita Jayakodi. In in the ICT tower, he did some three meter thick uh, concrete. I can't remember if it's a transfer plate or uh, 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 a pile cap. I think it's a it's a pile cap of three meter. The pile raft. But again, you know, you really don't need uh, pile rafts in Sri Lanka. I will come to that in a different uh, uh, lecture. When I deal with foundations, I will explain why uh, tra why trans the pile uh, pile rafts work in uh, areas with reasonable soil condition, whereas it does not work in Sri Lanka because we have bedrock. So all those the topics we can discuss later. But what I have to keep in mind is casting a thick concrete in Sri Lanka because our temperature is high. It's a, it's a real challenge. And to overcome that challenge, I have done some work with uh, engineer Nuan Senak and my, uh, engineer Myron. You can type MTR Jayasinghe and DEF on Google, and you can download a paper on how to control the cement composition 
to maintain sufficiently low temperatures, not exceeding in 70 degrees, so that you can prevent delayed ettringite formation within the structure you are casting. So that's a very important paper. You can solve a lot of your problems that you encounter by when you try to cast big sections. By referring to that particular paper, and you can freely download it. It's, it, it was published on ISL in 2015. And one of the authors is uh, engineer Nuan Senaka, who designed the 77-story twin tower at which what we call address 606. His uh, consultancy firm, he designed, basically he designed it. And he's one of the top engineers because he designed so many other structures that you see uh, at Budgamo Road, Rajagiri. Budgamo Road, Rajagiri, you can see a lot of structures. And he also designed this Marga, uh, Marga One building and so many other structures. And he has designed the tallest building in Sri Lanka, which is which, where, the, where the first tower will be completed in about one year's time. And they are still, uh, you know, the, the second tower is already done halfway, but they are taking time to complete the second tower. And at the end, they will connect the two towers with the helipad at the top. So that is, that is the, once completed, it will be the tallest building in Sri Lanka. But at the moment, it is uh, the tallest is 68-story Altair. So, so in, in, in the case of Altair, I certified that. And one of my top students is, has design, already designed the 77-story Twin Tower. And he, he's, the, he's the author of his, the, his, this based on his his MSc research and some of the other research done as undergraduate research by an uh, engineer called Myron, who, who has already completed the PhD in Queensland University of Technology. So basically, uh, you can download that paper. It's a very useful paper. Read it. You can get a lot of information about how to control the temperature in, in concrete, in, especially in thick concrete. Right. So basically, I have given you very important clue that is when you want when you go for transfer beams beams need to be square not rectangular and the other important thing is if you have walls supported not on the center of the beam but with an eccentricity that must be clearly represented in the model and i have shared one of the presentations that I used, a PowerPoint presentation. I used uh, one of the PowerPoint presentations in the, on the second lecture. And uh, that PowerPoint presentation, you can get uh, some diagrams. And another day, I will show you those, uh, those diagrams so that you can understand it better. But uh, today, now I have covered this one, beams. And I showed you how to be careful. Now the trans cellular transfer plate. What are the advantages? There are many advantages of cellular transfer plate. What is the first advantage? It's lightweight. Why? We are having a top slab and a bottom slab, but we don't have. The center is empty at many places. The center is empty, so we can, we can save a lot of, and we can avoid the functional effects easy. So what we have is something like this, and we have beams. Now the beams need not be square, they can be rectangular as well. What is the reason? The torsional shear will not go like this, but it will go like this. So you can see in uh, bridges, we use I sections. We use I sections and construct bridges. And we say torsionless system. We say these I beams are very weak, they cannot take torsion. On the other hand, we can have box sections. Like in Orogodowata flyover, Japanese Friendship Bridge, they are all this. What is the advantage? Very strong in torsion. 
very strong in torsion because torsional shear will flow like this. Torsional shear will flow like this. So very high liver arm. Liver arm is very high. So torsional capacity is very high in this case. So the moment you create a cellular raft, the torsional torsion capacity is very high. So you don't you don't have to go for square. You can have rectangular, rectangular beams. You can have rectangular beams because now the individual torsional carrying capacity of a beam is not that important. Not that important. So then you will you need something like. 350 to 400 millimeter slab. Why? Because the weight of the beams and the weight of the top slab will be carried by this particular slab. So we cast the slab, but you don't have to, the loads are lower because we are having voids. So the reinforcement requirement in a slab need not be very high. In addition to that, you can always prop about two floors below so that the loads can be shared as well. Load can be shared as well. And then you get uh, all these loads coming at different locations. No problem. Why? Generally, you select the, the beams, the, the transfer beams in the cellular structure at the locations where the walls are coming, where the walls are coming from above. So that walls are directly supported by the the Walls are directly supported by the the rib, the web. Web is directly supporting the walls. That's one. So what what do you, what do you need for the top slab? Generally, we go for two hundred millimeter, and we ensure it has two mats of reinforcement. We go for the top slab of two hundred, and we'll ensure it has two mats of reinforcement everywhere. Why? Because it's very useful to carry torsion. It's very useful to carry torsion when you have two watts of reinforcement because the slab is strong everywhere. Slab is strong everywhere. So that's a signal. So here you will design this bottom slab to carry all these loads. And then, then you will get reinforcement, say R1. Then you consider the overall behavior, you get R2. You provide R1 plus R2. That is the bottom reinforcement that you provide. So this way you can easily design a structure. Very easy to model this. Very easy to model this. When you are modeling uh, modeling a trans cellular transfer plate, you can actually model the top slab and bottom slab and the beams separately. And generally the beams are uh, beams are modeled by using shell thick shell element, thick shell elements, thick shell elements. You use shell elements to represent the beams, and you have to you have to uh, understand how to uh, rep how to interpret the results, because now you are going to get stresses, not the forces, not the bending moments. So so you might have to think a little bit when you are providing reinforcement. On the other hand, you can forget about the top slab and the bottom slab. Simply model the beams. Simply model the beams. But don't worry about the eccentricity. Do not worry about the eccentricity. You might get torsional moments. You can model it as if it is a transfer beam structure, not a cellular a cellular plate. But all the torsional effects you can ignore. Torsional effects you can ignore because knowing very well, cellular raft can carry torsion without any problem. So you have to have a good understanding of the behavior of plates and villages when you are designing a transfer plate. And if you have a good idea, no problem, because once you ignore torsion, what you get is shear and flexure. If you have shear and flexure, you have a beam, no problem at all, because we all know how to design a beam subjected to bending and shear. We know, we all know how to design a beam subjected to bending and shear. If you have any doubt, you can refer to Muzi and book series by Muzi and Banji. If you have, if you want BS code, you can refer to the earlier versions. If you want the Euro code, you can refer to versions six and seven. 
six and seven. You can get, you can clear all your doubts because they have given a lot of examples. That is one of the best books for you to understand easily. Because you can also read the books by McGinley, but they are more complicated. They try to cover more complicated stuff. So if you are beginning, not that easy to understand the books by McGinley, but very easy to understand the books by Moosley and Bunch. So my recommendation is start with Moosley and Bunch's book. Once you are confident, read the book by McGinley as well, because McGinley's book covers various other situations that are more complicated than you. If you want to be a real expert, you should have knowledge that is covered in McGinley as well. But I will try to uh, cover as much as possible in this lecture series so that uh, you know when you read these books, you will be able to understand the, the contents of the books very easily. So any questions? So I will cover three options for transfer plates. Uh, one is the real transfer plate, which I don't like very much. Then the transfer beams that I like a lot. And cellular, cellular transfer plates that again I like a lot. And if I give the examples, uh, we used, uh, there's a building called, it's under a big building in Nugegoda, 14 story building called Porsche uh, by uh, uh, Homeland Skyline. And then that building we used transfer beams. Then if you look, what are the buildings that we have used? Cellular transfer plates. We use cellular transfer plates in uh, Sky Garden. Mr. Uh, Mr. Seneca, Engineer Seneca used uh, cellular transfer plates in Sky Garden. And then uh, I used, uh, he's the designer, I was the reviewer. And then um, I, I again helped uh, Sanken Lanka to save a lot of money by going for a cellular raft, a cellular uh, transfer plate in uh, Cinnamon Red Building. Cinnamon Red Building is a special one because it is having uh, six stories of car park, seventh floor you have the reception, the, uh, and then uh, restaurants and all kinds of things. And then you get a transfer plate at the 10th floor. And then 13 floors of hotel, 13 floors of hotel. It's a 23 story building. But the problem is, how do you cost such a massive amount of concrete at the 10th floor? Not easy, huge weight. So when they talk, when we talk, talked about it, uh, I proposed, let's do a value engineering for this building. Let's go for a cellular, uh, cellular uh, plate, cellular trans plate. And then we did a lot of uh, additional modifications and we save a lot of money from that bill. So that is a good, another good example where cellular raft has been used, cellular play, transfer plate has been used. And then if you want a building with a solid uh, transfer plate, which is a Singaporean design, and that you can find in Crescat Monarch, Crescat Monarch. Crescat Monarch has a, a solid transfer plate. And then how do you optimize solid transfer plates? There are the options that can enhance the performance of concrete. And one of the options is going for pre-stress concrete. And there is another option. So there are so many different options. Today I have covered three simple ones and I have highlighted the problems. So if you don't understand how to design for torsion, go through the book by Mosley and Banji, because there's no point in trying to cover that type of things uh, in a lecture series like this, because we cover those things for our undergraduates. So all our undergraduates know how to design for torsion and so on. So they learn uh, those things as undergraduates. So some of these at a higher level where we like you to become practicing engineers. But uh, if, you, if you have any doubt, always refer the book by Mosley and Banji. And once you are okay with that, you are happy. Then if you want further knowledge, uh, refer the book by McGinley. That is also a very good book. It is a huge book. And then uh, if you want further information, uh, there are many other books. But uh, most of those books are American books, but still you can read it. 
like you know they cover deep beam designs uh, b zones d zones and all kinds of things are covered very well in those books so by reading other books based on australian practice and american practice you can learn something but uh, always stick with whatever the uh, books written for the codes that are using and i'm sure shortly we we'll all have to go for euro codes so if you are not familiar with euro codes start reading mostly and i think still seven is read six version six or seven you can get lot of knowledge and information so uh, do you have any specific questions yeah actually there was one brace hand situation now he is left i think aha uh, uh-huh. uh, it's okay there are two few questions in the chat box yeah what are they what what about the maximum or preferred grade of concrete for transfer beams ah yes yes transfer if you are going for transfer beams or oh, transfer beams are a major problem but what you have to understand is we are using huge structures huge sections if you are using huge sections you have to ask a simple question have we optimized the design no we are using new sections because because you want to make sure the walls are supported some of these walls can be staggered in the staggered in the building but still you want to have one beam supporting all these staggered columns so what do you do you increase the width of the beam and make it look big so that you can create enough number of voids rather than two beams you will go for a one big beam if you are using a one big beam the question is have you got a optimized design or not the answer is not it is not optimized if the structure is not optimized what is the point in using high strength concrete no use so that, so if i am designing a big structure which is bigger than what i need i will use grade 30 concrete 30 megapixel concrete I'll use 30 megapascal concrete, a maximum of 35. I'm not using anything more than that. Why? To get high strength concrete, you need lot of cement. Lot of cement means very high chance of exceed in 70 degrees. So don't use it. And then I will use. I will also define. I don't want high strength in 28 days. So these are all allowed in Euro codes. I don't want high strength in 28 days. I am happy if I get, say, 30 megapascal in 28 days. Or I might even say 25, but it's a little on the low side. But I might say I'm happy. 30 megapascals in 30 megapascals in 28 days, and 40 megapascals in 90 days. How do you achieve that? You go for something like 20 to 25 percent silica fry ash. 20 to 25 percent fry ash. There's no need to use silica film for low strength concrete. So you'll go for 20 to 25 percent fry ash. What will happen? You can you can delay the strength gain because when the strength gain is delayed, low temperatures, and finally, but at the end of the day, at the end of 90 days and beyond, you are getting. Great forty concrete or forty megapascal concrete. So when you are doing the model, you specify the the strength of the transfer beams as forty megapascal. But when you are casting, you are casting only thirty megapascal concrete in twenty eight days, and you go for forty megapascal in ninety days. All these options, different options, are allowed in Euro code. That's why we like Euro codes. we prefer euro codes than british codes british codes are very restrictive but euro codes are far superior and when you use euro codes you can do few, you can make huge savings by thinking different thinking different so that's why you know you have to read the books that 
tell you the fundamentals like mostly and banji then you will gain the confidence of attacking the problems with different options available in in the course and that's what we call value engineering that's what we do and we allow any engineer to do the designs and then we say i'll save you 30% of that then we go for the modern euro codes we do all our designs according to that minimizing the section sizes and so on and then we save money and the 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 beauty of value engineering is whatever you save 90% for the client 10% for the 10% for you and if you save 200 million in a 50 story building your fee will be 20 million and to save these you don't need ages because the design is already done what they are doing is doing some modifications where you are saving the materials and every cube of concrete saved is a huge amount these days something like if because you are using special concrete it can be about 24000 rupee saving per meter cube every ton of steel you save is huge value these days because you are saving something like 350 to 370000 it can even go up to 400000 in some cases so you are saving a lot of material and uh, materials and you are saving a lot of concrete and if you are doing a government with the project where the 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 you have done a you have got a, somebody do the design the contractor has already done the billing and won the contract and after that the contractor comes and tell you i'll do well engineering and if you as the client you might like it because now you are going to save 500 million or something like that then when the contractor saves 500 million you have to pay you cannot get all 500 million half the saving belongs to the contractor half the saving belongs to the client so that way the contractor can easily pay out of his 250 million he can pay the designer who has already say 500 million the designer's fee will be 50 million so you can see if you don't go for cutting edge designs there's a chance that your designs will be challenged and then you will find the clients will start going for the designers who are doing the value engineering then come into you so that's why you always you have to think positively learn as much as possible and go for advanced designs that cannot be optimized by somebody else so what is second question yeah professor this is the one uh, who raises hand do yeah. we need distribution bus in a co of transfer plate no basically distribution bar is a cat control in reinforcement right so basically what we do is we provide cat control in reinforcement and it can act as a distribution bar so the most important thing in a transfer plate is how to control cats so you'll find transfer plates top top mat maybe out of 20 20 mm bars at 150 to 200 centers sometimes you'll find it's you need huge amount of reinforcement at the top surface to prevent thermal crack so that's the disadvantage of going for transfer plates because you need huge amount of concrete when you have huge amount of concrete one question one problem is it's already cracked say 80% of that concrete is useless because it's cracked and below the neutral axis secondly because we are using lot of cement to control cracking we need huge amount of reinforcement so you have you have, you have penalties on two fronts so that's why i don't like uh, transfer plates i mean uh, i'm not against it but what i always say is try the other options first and failing everything okay if you can't do anything else okay let's go ahead with transfer plate but if you have if always you i'm sure you will always you'll find sometimes you might completely eliminate the transfer structure by working with the architect and coming up with innovative solutions like some additional car parking space outside the building connected to the building but outside so so you can you can have a suboptimal car park 
but optimum apartments but uh, because it's sub optimal you can you can provide all the rent all the car park in it so you will extend the car park outside the building and there you will go for the optimum spacing for car park you know, there is no restriction on the other hand you will find that you know that's not possible because land is not available then you go for the solution where some transfer structure is needed so you first try whether you can use the the beams and you think uh, beams are a little too much and you know problematic then you might go for cellular rafts and when you have cellular raft again cellular uh, transplant and you have something like this sometimes you find that you know you might be filling up some of these areas and those areas are filled up additionally because you need those fillings to support the walls and sometimes you might find one of these grid is some is completely filled up by is completely filled up by concrete why because there are few walls and so rather than building beams here and there it we might find filling up one cell is much cheaper so there are so many options always approach attack the problem with an open mind with an open mind then you can always come up with a completely out of box solution that you can rank as an optimum solution so that's how you have to do it so don't think you know transfer plates are very difficult or anything they are just like slabs and we know how to design a slab but the problem is these are thick slabs very heavy slabs so we should see how we can optimize is that all clear any response is there you can you can respond <laughs> yeah yoga yoga pra shall i go to the next question uh, professor yeah yeah yes please can we continue vertical service ducts through the transfer floor Yes, if you want, you can you can go through because uh, small voids will not be a problem because you can see we have we can all always make it uh, cellular, but it's a uh, it's it's much easier because this you know although you think it you can have a duct it's not that easy, it's always easier to divert the ducts the all the plumbing work above the transfer plate and then fill the transfer plate with a three hundred millimeter thick lightweight fill. Fill the transfer plate with a 300 millimeter thick lightweight fill. It is it is all less it is all less better because uh, you know when you say you are going to cast a shaft a void through 1.5 meter deep or 1.8 meter deep plate, not easy. It's very much easier to divert. the bend the services and divert to wherever you want then you can have one big shaft and take all the services through one big shaft rather than taking uh, with so many different shafts so that's what we generally do and then we fill it up with 300 mm thick concrete very easy lightweight concrete or oh, form form concrete and if you want uh, you can easily uh, contact this person uh if you want anything on uh, foam concrete you can contact mr sisir at precon marketing and he's 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 very good with that uh what's his name number not 77 sorry 77 687 you can contact mr sisir he's a, he is very good in innovating things and his company is called precon marketing and uh, he will uh, do all your light pit fills no problem and he is is one of the most uh, one of the best uh, people for that particular task in sri lanka because he 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 knows he has machinery for doing uh, fill any in at any floor level in any building 
any floor level if you if you want to fill in the 60th floor he will do it for because he has simple machinery that he has made himself for that type of tasks okay what is the next question uh, do we need to align web of transfer flow and walls web of transfer Tra web of transfer flow Tra that is cellular cellular one is that right is is i think talking about cellular one otherwise there is no web web comes only in the cellular one yes cellular one uh better to better to try and uh, otherwise you know you can't support a wall on a thin thin slab always you need to have some kind of concrete fill inside the cellular one so so carefully select it so we have to talk with architect and then initially select the arrangement of the transfer plate whether it's a transfer plate or a cellular cellular transfer plate or a beam slab type transfer transfer beam system so that all you have to select but if you can't align it in the cellular one it's not a problem you because you you have all the torsional effects will be taken up easily by the cellular structure whereas in the case of transfer beams they are not on the center then you get torsion so that's simple any other question yeah is there any necessity to add an additional vertical reinforcement in between lift joints other than shear and torsion to control transfer shear to Oh, yes, yes. Of course, generally what we do is uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. What we do is sometimes you know we locally thicken the thicken the shear walls at the transfer plate level because we are getting huge beams coming and connecting to the uh, shear core. Shear core. So because of that reason, generally if you have transfer plates, uh, we don't use anything less than three hundred millimeter thickness for the. It is less than 300 millimeter thickness for the sh uh, lift show, lift core walls. If you have transfer plate, generally we use 300 millimeter thick walls for the for the lift core below the below the car park level at the car park levels. And then what we do is we temporarily, you know, we artificially thicken the wall so that the local stresses can be easily distributed. without causing any damage to the shear wall, shear walls or the lift lift core walls so it's a good question it's a good practice thicken it so if you have 300 mm thickness you can make it 600 in the as a band so you all your transfer beams will be connected to the band not to the wall and band can always distribute the stresses evenly so that uh, there will not be any adverse effect on the the shear wall the shear walls of the lift core uh, and also you will ensure you if you do a proper analysis you will always find concentration of stresses so because of that reason we will locally increase the vertical reinforcement in the shear walls at the transfer plate level so instead of having some 16 mm bars at 200 you might have you might try 25 mm bars at 200 at that level locally say 1.5 meters above and 1.5 meters below the transfer plate you might have 20 mm bars uh, 20 or 25 mm bars at 200 centers locally the idea is you know you will have the normal 16 mm bar and you will try an additional 25 mm bar why any local problem will be well looked after by the additional reinforcement That's a good question. Any other question? There are, but I don't know whether the participant is here. What about the allowable incremental deflection for the transfer plate? Ah, that's a very good question. When you are designing the transfer plates, always keep in mind, transfer plate is not going to be loaded at once. Transfer plates are loaded with the construction sequence. That means. You you have to do a construction sequence analysis when your uh, e taps allow it, sap allow it, sap little difficult, e taps much little easier. But you must do a construction sequence analysis, which means 
the program will consider that the building is you are analyzing is not constructed at once. It is constructed stage by stage, floor by floor, and then you will find the bending moment due to dead weight of the structure. Dead weight of the structure is higher than what you get just by doing a straightforward analysis. Considering that the whole structure is is available, so generally. I use a rule of thumb. I generally consider the bending moment due to dead weight, due to the self weight of the structure, will be increased by 50%, and the shear force will be increased by 25%. But when I say 50%, overall increase is lower because you know you get live loads, dead loads, all then the live load moment will not increase because live load moment will not come until the structure is over. So because of that reason, we don't worry about the live load, live load effects, but we certainly uh, will get the dead load effect coming step by step. And that means generally I consider the dead load moment will be increased by 50% when I do a design and I might not even bother to do a serious calculation but if you want, you can ask the program to do a serious calculation because uh, there are facilities available in SAP 2000 as well as uh, uh, ETERS and also MIDAS also gives that facility. And MIDAS is uh, considered a very uh, uh, a really good program for construction sequence analysis. MIDAS is considered as a really good program for construction sequence analysis. And uh, so many engineers uh, generally use that program for, for construction sequence analysis. Any other question? Yeah, uh, quickly I'll go through. Can we start columns from cellular transfer plate? Yeah, yeah. So when in a cellular transfer plate, whenever you want to start a column, you might locally thicken, locally thicken the thicken the beam. Locally thicken the beam so that you can start a start a column. No problem. You can start it, but it must be on a beam. It must be on a beam. So if you don't have a beam, uh, increase the size of the adjacent beam. Then that way you can bring the column onto the beam. Any other question? Hello? Sorry, you can hear me. <laughs> what yeah, about yeah, yeah. vertical steel plates with studs for shear? And uh, again, with, with the same vertical steel plates to accommodate shear in transfer beams. Uh, generally, you know, now when you are now you are talking about composite construction. Mm. Now, you know, these days, you know, uh, I would go with one material rather than trying to mix up so many things. And do things that a directly don't understand. Now, at the end of the day, whatever you do, you have to take the responsibility. So, because of that reason, I would prefer to do things in the way that we understand, rather than doing experiments in a tall building. Because if something goes wrong, you know what happened in uh, Miami a uh, few months ago when a tall building collapsed, 150 people died, and uh, do you know what is the reason for that collapse? It is because, you know, they have not done a construction sequence analysis. So they have not increased the moment to allow for a construction sequence. Then what happens is you construct complete the building. Nothing happens because the building is new. Everything is strong. But with time, the cracks, the because the now the bending moment is, you are not considered the increased bending moment. You have underdesigned the structure. So what happens is under design structures will have a higher crack width than the normal structures. And then with the with through cracks, you get ingress of salt water and all kinds of salty materials. They, they form chloride, they, they will give rise to chloride attacks, and chloride attacks can create corrosion without showing any sign of corrosion. That is the biggest problem with chloride attacks. And we call it pitting corrosion. Pitting corrosion occurs without increase in the volume, so you will not see the deterioration of reinforcement. So that's why I have a simple rule. 
increase the dead load moment by 50% because the actual increase is only about 25 to 30%. But uh, trans applied is a key element and I have no hesitation to over design the key elements. Because if a key element crashes, everything else collapses. So because of that reason, I have no hesitation to make the big uh, uh, over design a key element. Now the time is close to nine o'clock. Uh, shall we stop? Yeah, I think there are so many questions. But anyway, I will uh, actually the thing is this from service uh, participants cannot unmute themselves. I tried myself. I also couldn't unmute them. So uh, uh -huh. sorry about it. And uh, I think so it's nine, uh, almost nine. So shall we stop? Uh, yeah, yeah. So, so basically, I mean, when we start next day, they can ask uh, some more questions if they have. So yeah, we can exactly. have a question and answer session before okay. we start the next lecture next day. Yeah. Uh, so, so if you can collect the questions in the chat box, and then uh, you know you can raise it next time uh, be, as soon as we start, we'll 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 just refresh their memory. And then oh, yeah. uh, we'll answer some of the questions, and then uh, then we can start the next lecture because it's yeah, always it. it's always good to answer all their questions rather than you yes. know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. So actually, yeah. Thank you, thank you, from I want to yeah. actually can't ask anyone else so so to make this word of thanks. So yeah, uh, we had a very 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 informative and very effective lecture. So uh, a big thank to you, professor. And yeah, thank you. Worthy lesson delivered, and I thank uh, our organization subcommittees presentation yeah. sharing. Actually, we are doing now. Uh, yeah. So I extend my sincere thanks to ISL uh, with all these difficulties. They are also supporting this. Yeah, actually, yes. Really, yeah, without these participants, uh, we and they are getting a good knowledge. And thank you for all your participation. Yeah, yeah. Your actually, uh, it's a little unfortunate. We had a little technical problem in initially. Yeah, exactly. Because I'm having so, an i7 computer, and this is, today is the first day. It, it became slow. Generally, it's a yes. very fast computer. i7 yeah. new computer, but uh, due to some reason, computer became extremely slow today. Yeah. So, so basically, That's and also, and also. Uh, I had to come uh, go for a uh, urgent meeting today at Nigambo Hospital. So do help him out with some work. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So yeah, what we managed, so and thanks to the very good highway network in Sri Lanka. Yeah. I was at uh, I was in Nigambo at five o'clock, and uh, and sorry, not five six o'clock. See, uh, even at six o'clock, I was in Nigambo and I managed to come here by seven fifteen. So thanks to the wonderful job done by our road development authority engineers. And uh, today we are having a very good road network in Sri Lanka. And uh, today I shared one of the WhatsApp messages showing some of the things they have done uh, by uh, road development authority and the private sector companies in Sri Lanka. So, so if you have, uh, I think you have already got that message and you can share it with uh, other engineers who are participating. Uh, if you can get the telephone numbers, I'm sure you, uh, you can form a WhatsApp group and then we can share this kind of very important information that, uh, that actually shows that Sri Lanka, as Sri Lankans, we can do wonderful things uh, if we start using our own knowledge. Okay, with that, uh, we'll conclude it. Thank you very much. Yeah, I, I have a small message. Um, yeah. One participant wanted to get some geotechnical knowledge uh, and they wanted us to organize. But quickly, I, I have to thank engineer Kriti Sri Sena Naika. When I put yeah. this message, he quickly sent me the link from uh, um, engineer Sahabandhu who is doing organizing on 26th uh, uh, December, I think this month. Uh -huh. uh, yeah. I put that so in the January, January, so January, 26th of January or? Yeah. This, this one because they wanted to face the interviews uh, for ISL professional oh, reviews. Right, right, right. Okay, okay. Anyway, very good, very good. Yeah, yeah. What, he, what he sent me was well matching. So uh, it's a great support. I put it in the chat box. So okay, all okay, you right. have seen yes. that. Yeah, so and, also, that. and also uh, for this lecture series, I'll be getting uh, Dr. Nalindi Silva to help us, uh, you know, with some of the geotechnical lectures. I will also cover some geotechnical lectures. And also for Thursday program, we are planning to get uh,
with uh, who, who has done a lot of work on file and so on so we'll get uh, so many lectures on geotechnical engineering as well to help all, all our engineers to you know improve their skills on geotechnical geotechnical engineering yeah. okay then so we told that uh, we thank you everyone so thanks a yeah, lot thank you thank Bye. you very much yeah